Right. So uh, I'll just start with a quick recap of what we saw the last time. Just go there in the corner. Yeah. We saw that to, uh, to describe the formation, you needed a description of forces as well. And in this course, we are only uh, concerned with static forces, st static deformations, no motion, and uh, only um, surface tractions, surface forces, not uh, body forces. Right? And we saw that was uh, Cauchy's assumption that uh, the traction were described by uh, a measure, a vector, called the, the stress vector, which gives the force per unit area in the in the deformed configuration T of n. And we saw several properties of it. We saw that T of n was minus T minus n, and n that's the that's the normal unit normal to a small uh, area element dA on the surface of our body or a region of the body, right? And then another thing we saw was Cauchy's theorem proving that Tn is related linearly to N through this tensor S, which is a uh, uh, sigma, sorry, which is a um, uh, independent of n, right? n is the so-called Cauchy stress tensor. And then the consequence of the, so that was the consequence of the balance of linear momentum, uh, if you write that for the tetrahedron and so on and so forth. The consequence of the balance of angular momentum, it was, sigma, it was that sigma turns out to be, or must be a symmetric tensor. And so, a tensor has nine components, you know, if, if you're represented by a matrix. The three of these, the three that are on one side of the diagonal, are the same as the three on the other side of the diagonal. All right? And then the equation of um, static equilibrium just says that the sum of all the traction. Uh, forces acting on the closed surface in the current configuration is zero. And you can use the divergent theorem to show that this is the same as the, that saying that the divergence of sigma is zero. Right, that's the same. Okay, so that, that's, that's why we saw the last time introducing uh, this new object and these new notions of uh, surface traction. And as you can see, uh, that's why in the first chapter I talked about tensors. There's no way around it. If you want to describe forces for a deformable body, or soft solid, for instance, or for a fluid, uh, if you want to describe for a system of forces acting on, on elements of, the, of that continuum, you, you're going to need three vectors three vector forces. And, and so, yeah, if you stack them together, you end up with a matrix or to a second order tensor, right? So like it helps to imagine that the solid is made of small cubes like this that are stacked one onto another. And then on, on the faces of all, on the six faces of these cubes are forces, right? So if I can have, for instance, uh, E2, T e of E2, then remembering that T e of minus E2 is the opposite vector. A vector like this, uh, this vector has three components, right? It's not necessarily aligned with E2. And similarly, uh, I can have E3 like T of E3 like this. And that will mean that 
your mass E3 is like this. And then there's also uh, D of E1, and then D of minus E1 on the opposite face. Okay, now if I look in general at, uh, at the traction acting on the surface, okay, surface element DA, and that surface element is in a plane with normal N, right? You have N. And I'm saying that there's the traction T here, acting on that little element. Well, I can decompose T into two components, one along the normal, and one along didn't draw that well. The tangent plane. Actually, it's just as well, it's like this now. Okay, maybe I'll put a few plane. Right, so that plane I've, I've drawn, that's the plane that's tangent to the surface at that point where the area element is dA. So I'm, I'm, I'll have uh, I'll have uh, a tangent and a normal components, right? Tn, I want to say, is the sum of the normal stress magnitude argon coordinate sigma, say, so that is here, that's sigma n plus the tangential stress. And that's called the shear stress. And we'll call that tau. So, so tau is going to be this vector here. So the, you can see now why it's called the shear stress because it, it acts in the surface and it's like shearing that surface with respect to the rest of the body. And then the normal stress is just, you know, pushing or pulling normal to that. All those, those terms make sense semantically, right? Sigma is going to be the stress along N. I don't know if you write it. Dot sigma N. Should be sigma T with sigma T, sigma the stress uh, tensor is symmetric, so that's fine. And then the shear stress tau it's just the n minus sigma n. Yeah, you can see that if I add normal and tangential stress, I get t. So one is one over the minus the other. So normal stress, shear stress, these are important uh, concepts. If you remember, we had an example earlier. In fact, I don't remember exactly how the stress was. I think it was something like this. Remember there were zeros here, there was minus two here, and then maybe there was three, four, something like this. Right, so if I look at the stress, stress vector, stress force, 
uh, traction force per unit area on so in that example we're saying this stress is applied to a cube of uh, side 2a so if i look at the the top face for instance the stress applied on the top face top face is uh, x3 equal a so the normal top face is e3 Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have put the dot. Is T of E3 and T of E3 is going to be my T E3. So it's the final, the third column. So it's a vector with component minus two, zero, and four. Now, and that can be decomposed into uh, normal stress. So the normal stress is going to be E3 dot E3. And that's going to be 4. I didn't specify the, the dimension. It's called the, uh, Pascal, the, the, the international system that, uh, unit of stress is the Pascal force per unit area was so newton per square meters and uh, tau the tangential stress the shear stress it's what's left once you removed the normal stress so it's just minus two one so there's a uh, a normal component of magnitude four, and then there's a shear component of magnitude magnitude two. Okay, so all those all those are I think okay concepts. You could figure it out just from the name. Don't hesitate to, to ask questions if I might go too fast. Right. Well, in general, general sigma has nine components, but only six of which are independent. Because three of diagonal are equal to the other three of diagonal. Right. And, and just like a vector has three components in general, uh, you can always find uh, a coordinate system where the vector has only one component. Right? If you take a coordinate system with one of the axes aligned with that vector, then has only one component, the other two components are zero. You can do the same for a tensor, for, for an object that's represented by a, a, a three by three matrix like here, you could find a system of coordinates so such that there are lots of zeros in that in the in the representation the matrix representation of the of the tensor in that case it become uh, the optimal uh, choice is the one that gives you just the diagonal and all the off diagonal terms are zero so you have just three terms the diagonal terms and then zero 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 and six zeros that's nice that's called diagonalizing a matrix. And it, it just goes back to what we've seen already for, for the strain, is just go back to finding the eigenvectors, finding the eigenvalues, and so on and so forth. Right? In this case, sigma is symmetric. And we saw it means that the eigenvalues are real. And the eigenvectors orthogonal and so if you place yourself in the in, in the coordinate system aligned with the eigenvectors you have an autonormal uh, basis there and you will find that the, the matrix has just three non-zero components right so 
those things, the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, they found by solving the eigenproblem. Solving something like this. Maybe I should call it N. Ah, oh, that's okay. Now, remember we were looking for the eigenvalues of B, we had to solve B N equals lambda squared N, right? So here, first you have to solve the characteristic equation. Which is going to be a cubic in sigma. And that's going to give you three eigenvalues. We're going to call them sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. All right, so you'll have a cubic, but you know that there are real roots. And the, the difference with the strain tensors now is that the, the, the eigenvalues could be negative. Strain tensors that to be positive, yeah, they could be negative. But other than that, it's exactly the same, the same uh, procedure. And those eigenvalues, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, they are called the principal stresses. And then you have to find the eigenvalue, eigenvectors, sorry. You have to solve. Uh, homogeneous systems of equations, right? You have to find n1, which would be the eigenvector associated with sigma 1, and 2, the eigenvector associated with sigma 2, and n3, the eigenvector associated with sigma 3. So this is a homogeneous system because if you bring uh, the right hand side to the left, then you'll have sigma minus sigma one i times n one. You know the determinant of that system is zero, and so you know it's a homogeneous system. So it, in fact, it's three equations equal to zero, but only two linearly independent equations, and, and that, that gives you the, the arbitrariness of the magnitude of the eigenvectors. I find one eigenvector or any any vector that's proportional to that eigenvector is also an eigenvector. Um, so you can normalize, you could just among all those eigenvectors find one, uh, take one that's uh, of unit length, and then you can form a direct orthonormal basis n1, n2, n3. Three orthogonal. Eigenvectors right and those eigenvectors are along what is called the principal axis of stress. So you can have a huge uh, choice of exercises there with the basically in algebra exercise asking you to find the principal stresses, the principal axis of stress for a given uh, stress tensor. Just like earlier or in the assignment, for instance, you were asked to determine the, the principal axis of deformation uh, and the principal stretches if you were given a, a, a deformation field. So that was important to figure out along which directions the, the, the material was deformed the most or the least. Here you can find along which direction the material is, uh, is being acted upon the most or the least. Okay, so in, in the N1, N2, N3, Basis, provided we've taken those M1 and 23 to be a uh, unitary. Sigma is just going to be a diagonal matrix.
So now you see why linear algebra you are often asked to find eigenvalues, eigenvectors. That's just to diagonal a thing and get a better a better idea of you know what, what's happening along which directions. Okay, so I continue with the vocab. I'm going to introduce some common states of stress. Okay, here's a question. Would the direction be of greater stretch line? Yes, that's a very good question. Would the direction of greater stretch align with the direction of greater stress? And in this course, it will. And that's nice, right? And in a way, it makes sense because you know you you will expect that if, if you pull the most in this direction, that's that's where it's going to stretch the most. It's and that's the case for many materials or materials that are isotropic. If if you continue uh, learning about non-elasticity, you'll come across materials that are anisotropic and not isotropic. So basically, materials with fibers in them. I just just think of uh, you know like a soft soft material, soft matrix with fibers embedded inside inside it. Just think of um, a piece of meat, for instance. If you you know when you look at it and you're about to cut, you know that there are fibers aligned. In a, in a specific direction, the direction of the muscle. And that's the same in, a, for instance, in a hose, you know that you have a, a cylinder like this, a tube, and then inside uh, there are two families of fibers that are an, an angle. In fact, you can compute the angle to, to get and give you the best properties called the magic angle. I'm digressing now, but uh, there are materials with fibers. And then when there's a fiber, it messes everything up, right, with respect to, to that idea. But it, if you pull along the fiber, then it's, go, it's not going to deform much along that direction if the fiber is very stiff, but it might contract a lot in the, in the, in the uh, cross direction, right? And, and that makes sense. And then if you, if you deform at an angle with respect to the fiber, it's going to be really complicated. So in that case, the direction of principal stress do not align with direction, do not necessarily align with direction of principal strength. But for this course, thankfully, we are sticking to simple things or, or to the starter course, if you want, we're going to look at material that are isotropic, that behave the same in every direction. And so if you deform them in one direction, they want to uh, deform the most or the least in that direction. So good question. Uh, and in fact, we're going to see that mathematically uh, in the uh, later in the course. Okay, uh, let's say some stasis of stress. Uh, if you consider what's called hydrostatic stress, right? That's when you have normal stress only. everywhere. No shear stress. All right, so you just write like this, TN, we put minus, that's for convenience, seems more intuitive, as only normal stress for all n, all normals to the surface are under this type of stress. And P, that's a scalar field for the pressure. And that's the same as saying that sigma is minus P i. Remember that T is sigma n, so clearly here p is proportional to the identity. It's, it's what's called hydrostatic stress. And just to show you what it looks like, if I think of my body be made of tiny cubes like this, every face of the cube will be under this pressure. 
right? We'll have minus P, minus P here. Let's angle this face on the opposite on the opposite face. And then one like this on the opposite on the opposite face. So pressure, yeah, pressure is a scalar times the identity or times n if you're looking at the vector. It just applies on every face uh, of of uh, of a solid. We just if you're compressing or if you're expanding tensile pressure, that's what hydrostatic press, uh, stress is. That's just a term of vocabulary, but you come across it often, of course, in, a, in solid mechanics, point field mechanics, as well, in continuing mechanics. Okay, an important class of, uh, of stresses of the so-called uniform stress, uniform stress. That's when the components of sigma are constant. Constant components. Right, and that's, that was the case, for instance, in the example I had earlier here, minus five two, that didn't depend on, on the uh, position. So it was a uniform stress. It was applied these constant components. But, and then in that case, you can notice that, and then the divergence of a constant, basically derivative, is going to be zero. And so the equations of static equilibrium are satisfied. Automatically. So that's an important uh, subcase. And in that family, we have uh, what's called the uniaxial stress. Oops. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm on the wrong. I should be here. Sorry. So, uniaxial, uniform stress. Is when you have a normal force applied on one face. The solid, no shear force. So you could have a uniform hydrostatic pressure. That's when the, the pressure is a constant and is applied on all the faces. If it's applied only on one face, then basically you are either pulling or pushing on one face of the cube, right? only have this here and I want to call uh, T the force per unit area but here I put it compressive okay let's put it uh, inside Doesn't matter what, whatever you choose, right? If T is positive, that's called a tensile, tensile stress. And if T is negative, that's called compressive, compressive in the axial stress. Right, you can see that in that matrix, in that coordinate system here, sigma is going to be of this form T0000000. Is only along the E1 direction. And this is an important uh, state of stress, stress 
that's the one we always do in the, in the lab when we want to test the material. Typically, we, we just uh, manufacture uh, like a cylinder or, or a strip uh, and then we clamp it top and bottom and then we have a machine that pulls on it, measures the force as it's pulling, pulling, pulling and measure the stress, uh, the, the force, so that's the stress and then measure the displacement that gives you the strength. And then you have the um, experimental correlation between stress and strain and then you, train, you try to connect that to, to the theory and, and deduce uh, the material behavior theoretically, and then you can feed that into a more complicated problem than just the tension. Right, so uniaxial stress is very important. And then uh, you can have its, its opposite in a way, it's called the shear stress. I should say uniform shear stress. It's when you have a uh, shear force only. Applied on one face. This is our counterpart to the uniaxial uh, stress on normal force. All right, so in that case, it's going to look like this. You think of each cube as being subject to a force like that. All right, the sh shearing force. Ugh. And then in that case, sigma will only have the one, two component. And uh, as an aside, but we'll see that later uh, more in detail. As an aside, I just mentioned that this shear stress does not produce simple shear. You will think so. You will think that just by applying those two forces, you can create simple shear, right? If I, if I was to apply for side top, for side bottom, that would just uh, simple shear, uh, shear forces like this, uh, you would think that would create uh, simple shear. But in fact, that it's not this stress that will create simple shear. If I just apply those two forces, the, the, the face will probably go like this and it, won't be, it wouldn't be simple shear. You know, every horizontal plane stays horizontal, it's just gliding respect to another. To, to obtain a perfect simple shear, you will need shear forces, but you also need uh, normal forces to maintain those two plates, horizontal and parallel. But we'll see that, I'll just, I'll just noting it now, we'll see it uh, more rigorously in the next chapter. Okay, and another uh, uniform stress that's important, the plane stress. That's when the forces are applied in one plane only. So typically on the membrane or strip. Again, that oh, I was scary. Again, that's important in. Um, in the in the lab where where you test often you test membranes, right? So you have to think of something like this, like a thin object, and you're just applying forces in its plane. You leave the, the top and bottom faces for your stress, right? So you're applying sigma one one, and sigma one two here. And they're opposite on the opposite face. And then sigma 2, 2. And sigma 2, 1, which is the same as sigma 1, 2. 
as a shear force. And then in that case, in that coordinate system, sigma will not have components in the third column and third row. We have zero regular components, zero in the third column and row. Okay, so that's it to describe uh, states of stresses. I'll just click the recording now so that 